Ah. Oh, yes. Is that the one? Yeah. That was a good chalk. All right, should we work? Should we be serious? I'm do, rolling. We're doing a documentary. We should be definitely serious. We should do a documentary, and we should be definitely serious. No laughing involved. Oh, have you seen this little guy here? Alright. <laughs> I came all the way from Italy to shoot in documentaries on your lens on the shotgun boogie. Shotgun boogie. I know that time is not on my side unless I find the love of my life on shotgun boogie. Okay, I'm a sound engineer from Italy working on a documentary about the city of New Orleans with a six months visa with the help of a couple of friends that are insiders as me. We're asking questions to musicians that are returning our call. My English is not good. This is pretty much what I can tell you in 30 seconds. As far as people rebuilding their homes and things, the community supported one another. This was the time before, before Facebook. You know, nobody really even text messaged. It was all email. So when our cell phone service wasn't working, that's how we were communicating. Everything that I own, including my heart of stone. I remember my neighborhood, like all the men in my, on my street, you know, kind of would keep watch at night. They had their guns and they would set up stations in the neighborhood because there was lots of looting going on and signs everywhere saying, you loot, I shoot. It was fend for yourself and like protect your neighborhood and come together and like work together and clean. And I'll build a boat out of my bay. Sink into my sail and always be resting my head. And there were people that were making online forums for missing animals, for how to clean your records that got flooded. You know, like all of these kind of communities started popping up that were very supportive. And so I think we came out the other end of it stronger something that happened that changed the face of the city is that there was contractors from all over the country who came here to work on houses because all the contractors here had their businesses flooded or had their houses flooded. A lot of people came down here um, for work, you know, and they got it because there was a lot to rebuild. And at the end of the day, you're grateful and you're thankful that someone helped you to rebuild your city like that. But oh, 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 oh. I was working on a roofing job and I'll never forget that first week that I was here, it was cold and so many people were so frustrated, but I remember turning on the radio and listening to WWOZ, which was an amazing thing that they came back so soon. And hearing the live wire and that there was like 30 or 40 shows in town, concerts all over the city in December, so soon after the levees failed. Definitely WWOZ had a, a strong hand in, in kind of reincorporating the music scene, and I mean, like, what better way to, like, 
start rebuilding your home than playing WWOZ <laughs> on the radio. You know. WWOZ 90.7 FM, New Orleans. Well, folks, there's all kinds of stuff going on these days, and I want to tell you, tonight we got Walter Wolfman Washington at DBA. You should check that out. The New Orleans Jazz Vipers from 7 to 10 at Angeles on Decatur. Joe Crown Combo, Maple Leaf, 10 p.m. Swing Night at Mid-City Lane's Rockin' Bowl. Support your local artist. It's the only way we're going to keep the city alive. So sometimes you have to start with the inspiration, you know, and I think that's what was happening in New Orleans, and I think that was one secret of our, of our rebirth and of things growing as quickly as they did, is that people went out and had a good time. And, like, they didn't have electricity maybe during the storm, but there was people drinking warm beer having a good time. Got my job right back at Circle Bar, and we were one of the only music venues that were open. A lot of really great shows there. There was a curfew. There was National Guard all over the place. Um, a lot of bands... Had, were missing members, a lot of people hadn't come back, so lots of bands were kind of morphing together. Early on, there were not very many, obviously very many residents of the city. And the main people that we were playing for were contractors. I mean, it was no tourists, obviously. I felt like it was really important to provide entertainment. Without music, this this would really be a bowl. This would be a shell of shit that y'all trying to preserve that don't nobody even care about if ain't no music here. You can try to preserve the lovely buildings and the French Quarter as much as you want, but every time they show any type of documentary or anything in New Orleans, who's gonna play first? That music. And of course, the focus was, let's get the music going. If we get the music going, then we can get everything else going. Everything just meant a lot more. This fierce survival pride, I guess, and then we're all, you know, drunk. But then there were also a ton of suicides. I shouldn't say a ton. Some ODs. And then um, a couple people got shot, too. And it was just like a lot, it was a lot of people dying during that time. It was a really, really, really rough year. Musicians started making their way back, little by little, uh, but many of them set up in other cities. You know, Austin was one place that they went. Jackson, Mississippi was another place that they went. But what I found is that that natural draw, that pull that New Orleans has, pulled them back. And so they give us a call uh, about Two years later, and they say, uh, Freddie said, I want you to come back home because we, we got a lot of how new houses we're coming up with, especially for all the old musicians that that Katrina taking away. Say, if uh, they all come back, so we're building a new home for them. The musicians village was uh, built just for certain musicians to come back and they built them homes. You know, that was awesome. We've never had. Uh, an actual village of musicians before, a place where they could actually literally live in the same space and also uh, rehearse, prepare their music. But in this particular situation, many of them had no homes. They'd been washed away. And then on the other side of, of town, uptown, I think is where the um, musicians clinic came out of wonderful, wonderful individuals who put their heads together, they put resources together, and they created a clinic for musicians. I went for my annual checkup yesterday with Dr. Catherine. It's the coolest thing. Musicians and artists often fall into this category where we're self-employed, you know, or we work for ourselves and we are paid cash, you know, and don't have 
insurance that comes from our job. So things like that, you know, made life better than it was before the storm. And there's definitely places where you drive around and you still see remnants of blue tarps on roofs and spray paint next to the front door that says what kind of damage was done and what they found inside the house. And uh, there's still little bits left over that you can tell, like water lines on the, on the middle of the house. A lot of New Orleanians, we have Katrina fatigue. We're tired of going on the road and having people say, so how is New Orleans now? Have you rebuilt since the storm? And we're like, well, you know, that was nine and a half years ago. It's been a long time. But mind you, there is, you can go to certain areas 10 minutes away from the French Quarter and see still evidence of what happened nine years after. The positive things that come out of it have to do with people from other places and our people going other places and coming back as well and bringing ideas from other places into New Orleans. All I can say about Hurricane Katrina, it was a tragic, it was a bad thing, but it also was a good thing. And the good thing was that a lot of people from New Orleans have never been out of sight of New Orleans. They never even left the Treme community for the most part. And for some of those people that went to Texas, that went to California, that went to all of these different states, they found a great opportunity for themselves, for their family. I don't want to characterize it only one way. There were, I had friends who were black and not black who moved away and were suddenly surprised that the world outside of New Orleans had a lot more to offer and chose to stay there. It was complicated. I mean, I'm just saying like one side of it was, yeah, people were kind of given just enough rope to hang themselves, like enough money to leave, but not enough money to come home via Red Cross and via, you know, FEMA money and stuff. It was like, oh, here's just enough money to spend the next six months away from, you know, New Orleans and get a new life started for yourself, but don't come home. Right. And the city was really explicit about that. Like one of our council people said, if you were on government assistance or lived in government housing before Katrina, don't come back. Very blunt, very you know direct statement. And I think a lot of people, that was really damaging to a lot of people, but then there were other friends of mine who were super happy. The only thing the government should do when it comes down to New Orleans is truly offering stipends to people that want to move back and could not afford to move back on their own because at the end of the day, your levy system is what forced us out of here, you know, without going through all the hassle. Because don't get me wrong, they tried to offer people some things, but it was an incredible hassle. And a lot of people feel as though they tried to get a lot of the black homeowners out of here. And that was the most disturbing thing for me, was coming home and realizing that, like, basically the entire black population of my neighborhood uh, was gone, including on my block, including like my neighbors who, my, neighbor, my block used to be 80% black and now it's maybe 20%. It's exactly flipped over, you know. That started immediately. Like as soon as, as soon as we came home, things were different. After the storm.